with Sheila will finish her keynote that she was so worried about. <laughs> I'll just begin with St. Dominic's quote when he was sending out his young men who felt utterly unprepared. They had not finished, their, uh, completed their philosophical and theological training. He said, go, the Lord is with you. And they were nervous. And he said, you'll be given what you need. And I'll refer to that some some point in the talk. Not sure where, but somewhere. <laughs> Um, I think art is the theater of contempl contemplative fluency. Contemplation one thinks of as silence and of entering into that sacred holy space of silence. Its fluency is its action. Um, and it's whatever way we explicate that, whether through word in our art or whether through music or video or painting, um, we've mentioned some of those, how it happens. So I believe that art is the theatre of contemplative fluency. Um, and we're going to begin, as I said, you'll always get a time or reflection or something because that's where I begin when I begin preparing for any talks. Um, and it will generally always have some embedding into the world that's struggling, um, as, as well as the world of hope that we hope to, to offer. And it's the African bush. May we heal the fissures and cracks in our collective soul. May we see ourselves from a different point of view. May we let go of outmoded beliefs. May we recognize the opportunities our stories offer for growth and acceptance. May we release the love. May love replace fear. May we each accept our personal responsibilities to make a difference. May we see that there is enough for everybody. May we eradicate poverty consciousness from our destiny path. May we be open to receive abundance from the law of sharing. May we dedicate ourselves to earth and her changes. May we make a leap of faith into a new way of relating to our planet and her people. May we stand in our truth and not be afraid to dream big. May we acknowledge that each person has something beautiful to offer. May we not be blind to these sacred gifts. May we not put limits on our creator. May we remember our true purpose. May each soul be like a bead strung on the necklace of cooperation and teamwork. May humility have its way. May we experience balance and beauty. May we commit ourselves to peace. May we celebrate our diversity in the oneness of love. May we be ourselves and flower freely. May we resonate and glow. May we take the next step.
don't know why it's still... No. <laughs> so we're going to move into um, natural systems and see how they, they inspire us this way. Okay. Um, God does everything to lure us and to cure us. That just blows my mind. The awareness that God does everything to lure us and to cure us. We know that Dominic um, re requires of us as followers of his that we have a contemplative stance in our world and a fast-knit relationship to Christ so that our words in preaching or in creating are authentic and true. At the heart of our world, its cause for existence is the divine inspiring, the longing and outpouring and the mystery of life itself which God gives us. The spirit infuses every creative and potent act in our world and in ourselves, and this from the dawn of creation. That's why, as I said earlier, that we are Genesis and incarnational people. Out of our human experiences of love, its triumphs and failures, we give witness to the abiding, life-giving creative spirit. The creative, creative giver of life abides so fully in our natural world. Now, when we hear that the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit given to us, we realize that this love is universal. It has no boundaries. It's all encompassing and all inclusive. We have to interrogate those parts of life where those aspects are compromised. Elizabeth Johnson said, human, planetary, and cosmic life, the unfolding of the natural world is into the vibrant practice of faith. So we are faith walkers, edge walkers in our world as artists. From our lens as artists, we have a particular focus to affect the numinous quality of life by beauty or its counterpart. Beauty is a type of resonance that pulsates with the bigger picture of what holds our world together and points us to so much beyond ourselves. It's never just about ourselves. That's why we are turning to the natural beauty of the world today. Life begets life. That's the initial thrust of the divine inspiring, as we've pictured it in Genesis, of, of the outpouring of creation. We are remarkably made of stardust. Remarkably. Everything participates in the creation and evolution of the entire web of connection. Whatever we do has its repercussions um, for others. God's never-ending creativity continually beckons us onto that fullness. So much diversity, so much rampant profligacy. This is something that I speak of, uh, that I reflect on myself, that when, wherever we experience life as tight, predictable, dumbed down, or we experience, uh, or we experience that we have stopped growing, if our experience is persistently one of stasis, we are not on the right way. We have stopped learning, we've stopped creating, and become part of the walking dead. So when I find myself tight, I say, Sheila, what's happening? I say, is it expanding me or is it contracting me? If it's contracting me, is it my behaviors that are dumbing down? Or is it a system around me that is preventing the freedom to come through? And we all know when we feel expansive and that doesn't need much interrogation. <laughs> but we do need to be self-reflective, as St. Catherine continually said, that we have to live in the cell of self-knowledge. So the leitmotif of the spirit is unequivocal. It's always one of expansion. It's always creative, always unconstrained. It's free, and it's true, and it's universal. And if it's not, we have serious questions to ask of ourselves or the structures in which we live. 
When we are consciously caught up in this extreme, ex extraordinary thermal stream of creativity, we are in abundant, flourishing life. Oops, wrong way. Oh, yeah, there, yeah, I'm in the right place now. So that's when we get constricted, frustrated, um, stress, exhaustion. And if our exhaustion is overwhelming, it's time we step back. We have to ask ourselves, how can God be God's best self in us? if we are closing in. So we may need time out. And, oops, I think oh. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> not for sure when you moved on, it would go away. <laughs> so we're on an adventure. Consciousness and creativity are inextricably caught up in ways that are always discovering an ever new world. So what is our vision and what actually sustains us? The mystery of God engulfs every person. As part of the Dominican family, we seek to articulate this reality. Um, I'm not going we're not gonna listen to that. We might come back to that. Whoops. Okay. Um, so we're going to look at nature in a particular way. What was Dominic's creative legacy? His intellectual coherence, his impulse for the whole with such love that echoes to our own age where we now celebrate the astounding advances of the, of the universe. We now experience quantum physics. Dominic would have, if he'd been in our time, he would have been open to that. Um, the dynamic patterns in nature, the patterns in chaos theory that keep propelling us to embrace the whole even as we are humbled by it. Artists are about that bigger, deeper picture. I believe in our pursuit of this adventure, we are both beggars and begetters. Our astonishing fecund world is inherently creative, uh, creative with the pulse of life. Take this incredible world of ours with its natural systems, such as the extraordinary bacterial colonies sending out a random walker from a cluster of 1,000 bacteria to locate food. My goodness, that is phenomenal. This is the very stuff of which we are made, the stardust of which we are made, the first forms of life on earth. God saw all that had been made, and indeed it was very good. Catherine could not muster enough metaphors to describe this goodness and creativity of God and the dignity of every human person, including creation. She said, O eternal Trinity, I have seen your depths, and in them I have seen the beauty of your creature, for in seeing myself in you, I have seen that I am your image. You, eternal Trinity, are the artist. And I, your handiwork, have come to know that you are in love with the beauty of what you have made. I have experienced beauty and God's presence through the prayer of women of Copenhagen. Every day they gather and they begin. One woman will choose a scripture passage um, and they will sing and they will pray and they will reflect on that passage. And sometimes a woman's pain is too much. And in the beginning of the prayer and the scripture which has touched her heart, you see tears come down her face. And you know actually that somebody in her family died the night before. And the women stop at that moment and they start humming uh, what sounds, what would be like us, like a lullaby. This, you know, the one that hits with such deep melancholy. They were, and then the words come. There's been that little moment of, of just the humming, and then the words come. And there comes a moment which would bring, make my hair, the hair on my arms stand on end. There comes a moment as they're singing that we experience the presence of God in each other holding that woman's pain. And it's nobody's controlling it. It, it then goes back to the lullaby and there is silence. We have not been able to change the fact that a loved one has died. 
We cannot replace that. We cannot change the system. And we have that beautiful thing in us wanting to fix systems. We cannot fix that, that pain, but we can stand with it. And that's so much of what we are being asked to in our prayer and our artistic creativity that we hope will find resonance in others so that it will hold them in their need. Um, and, and as I said, that's, you know, I experience God in us and God's um, preferential option for the poor and the beauty of God in holding that all together. So eternal Trinity, you are the artist and in your handiwork, I have come to know that you are in love with the beauty of what you have made. Going back to nature, life pursues abundance by its very nature, creating webs of co-evolution so that life could thrive. Attraction and interdependence all made for flourishing, each infinitesimal strand supporting the web of relationships. Our Western individuality has mitigated against that understanding that we are part of this incredible whole. We were born to be one. This demolishes the, the myth that only the fittest survive in a hostile world. We co-determine the existence of one another and the conditions of one another's existence. For flourishing or demise, the choice is ours and it needs to be an active choice. Life does not pursue parsimony. It pursues extravagance and abundance. From apparent chaos, extraordinary and complex patterning emerges. Anticipating bloods, floods, let's look at how nature um, copes with life. Anticipating floods, birds build higher nests. Intuiting wedding, wedding weather patterns, animals migrate to different places. So where there's no water, they find more water. Animals are known to show a special empathy around the elderly, the lonely, the sick, and the sad. Animals produce sufficient fur when anticipating harsher conditions or change their patterns of hibernation to accommodate these instinctual changes. Finches adapted and grew longer beaks to access a food no longer available to them before when their own source failed. We mustn't forget that when our own source fails, you know, our own human source, there is a source we dig deeper into. Um, don't we keep adapting and adjusting, adjusting like this, this incredible natural system um, and how, how we keep changing and processing and some things we let go of and some things we continue to work with. Um, and wonder, don't let us, let us ever forget wonder. If wonder has gone out of our life, we need to look closely at a flower or an insect on the ground. Um, I, I have experienced again and again the wonder of children with nothing. And to see them at play with a box, they'll, they'll shove their fists because they don't have scissors or anything. They shove their fists to make a hole and suddenly they're animals and they're playing around with the simple thing of, of boxes. Um, it's possible to find wonder in the most humble of things. Also think of the complexities of beehives, of termit hills, the migration of flocks. We may come back to that, but I think I'll probably run out of time. Um, the emergence of butterflies. Bilderbach says, the monarch changes in one lifetime its shape and its wardrobe, its means of location, its diet, from bitter solids to sweet liquid and its habitat losing nothing of its integrity. It merely deepened, expanding its physical horizons, transcending, but not including all the stages before. Isn't that an incredible um, explication of that ability to move with the tidal changes um, and to know that all of that which has gone before enables us to keep going. It's as it's as, he, as Bilderbach says, it loses nothing of its integrity. Everything has the possibility of finding new territories in our hearts if we move with those intuitive changes. If we are alive, we are subject to change, multiple changes. Clearly, there are highly 
complex levels of communication in our biosphere that we have not even begun to imagine. We are not the center of the universe, though I think we sometimes behave as if we are. <laughs> Nothing in any created um, human organization comes close to the readiness and necessity to, in order to adapt as we see in the animal kingdom. Would that we could harness this ability to reach out for that potential that is there gratuitously. What would happen to our world? About um, maybe seven or eight years ago, um, a shark was found off the Great Barrier Reef in Australia um, that had adapted to warmer waters. Nature finding a way. But that does not excuse that we have an incredible responsibility to make choices that will further give us a future um, in our global planet. I think we, that as humans, we have a, a, a propensity to want to settle, um, if settle in our comfort zones. And, you know, woe is the person who tries to move us sometimes. But the lessons are there. Our DNA, DNA is equipped for change. We only have to look at the animal kingdom and get inspiration from it. In order that we, this change helps us to be transformed into our fullest God-given selves. But we often resist it because it can ask more of us than we are prepared to give. I forgot to show you the, sorry, the one <laughs> I forget to look at this, 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 this screen, um, this beautiful monarch. Um, so, um, I've now lost my place. <laughs> um, so the providence of God. Dominic had huge providence, it had set his heart with, on huge, the huge providence of God, um, which we might call grace, which we might call part of prayer. The providence of God that allows us to tumble into God. When I was going through a particularly difficult time when I was a young sister, I know it's hard to believe, but I was a young sister once. <laughs> um, I came upon a translation of the psalm, and it said, Underneath are the everlasting arms. And it was it was a moment of grace. I was I was in darkness like I'd never had before. Underneath are the everlasting arms. There was nowhere where I could fall. I was not being held. That's an incredible awareness that no matter how hard things are, how dark things are, what pain we're in, underneath are the everlasting arms. God is always wanting to lure us and cure us into that reality. And I said to you earlier that um, Dominic gave us a way of providence. Go, the Lord is with you. You will be given what you need. The Spirit gives us what we need. Jesus is the story and the meaning maker of our vastly beautiful world, in which we are interrelated, interdependent, and need one another. This is just a picture of a, of a spider web, showing us how it's all interconnected. Creativity will never be found in conformity or compliance. There is never the same spider web. Um, that's why I didn't use the spoke of a wheel because it's manufactured and mechanical. Um, I, you know, you, you you can control that. You can't control the spider web. We need to welcome creativity, change, and possibility in order to thrive. When we lose sight of this reality, we end up institutionalizing or fossilizing life itself. We are hardwired people longing for meaning, and art externalizes this reality. The performing, auditory, written, and visual arts render another form of divine handwriting, indicative of that yearning of the human spirit for relationship, wholeness, and beauty, and encounter. So if I was to talk about the potency of arts, how can arts assist in this process? I love this. I mean, text and image 
uh, it's very close to my heart to be saying inspiring because it talks of language, it talks of beauty, it talks of our brother, Fra Angelico. And we have Kim and Jun here who explicates it in an abstract way because he wants us to go beyond surface realities into the light of God and God's self. So being an artist is an educator, is an art, an artist is an educator, an historian, an archivist, an interpreter, and a prophet with a mission. A task to integrate that past, present, and leave traces for the future. So it should be understood as a custodian of the people's cultural history, its aspirations as well as its protest. It's not yet fullness. We provide a third eye. Artists lead us, like Kim, beyond surface realities into paradox, confronting um, conf confrontation and contemplation. It urges us forward to what we might yet become. We're trusting a process and we don't know where it's going to lead us. We don't know what will, we will change along the way. We don't know what musical notes, like you spoke about the song we sang, how it took another person to bring it into yeah. strength together. Um, we need that from one another and, and we need to be able to um, bring those things together. So um, urging us forward, these things help us to become beauty and goodness, suffering and communion and aloneness. They coalesce under that tutelage, revealing God breaking through all our limits. I'm sure all of you could have stories that could tell when you have been taken beyond yourself, um, beyond what you thought possible. A dialogue between intuitive spirit and matter, and we do that in concrete form through the arts. It's about aligning ourselves to the holy in life, a sacred affirmation of God's resounding and unconditional yes to creation, to the whole of creation. The holy in life. Mama Sarah, one of the grannies in the project, um, I, sorry, I should prefix it by saying that I found us the opportunity to exhibit the women's work in Sydney, and I asked which women would like to participate, and I went to Mama Sarah because she makes the most exquisite embroidery, and I said, Mama Sarah, would, um, would you like to put your name down? No, sister, she said, no. And I said, why not? Your work is so beautiful. She said, I don't want to um, have to do something. Every stitch of mine is a stitch of love. Ooh. And it, 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 was a, it was a beautiful learning for me. Um, and quite humbly, she, it wasn't timed by her, quite humbly she came um, she handed her work, so the women would hand their work in, um, they get paid every month um, uh, if their work reaches a quality standard. We're, we're very strict on the quality because we don't want sympathy bias. She handed her work like two days before I was leaving with one of the women to come over here. Um, and I unfolded this work and I was gobsmacked. I was mm -hmm. transfixed by the beauty of this work. And of course it went up on exhibition, but she didn't want to be pressured yeah. when each stitch she had to take its time because for me that was contemplation and action and the final work was the outpouring of that contemplation. The holy in life. You know, we touch the holy, sometimes it passes us by and we haven't even been aware of it. Um, I try to, in my work with students, try to make them aware. Um, I, it's quite, I've quite often used the, the tool of them doing um, a mindfulness, find mindfulness map, you know, mind maps for learning and study. Um, so we do a mindfulness map. So we have these bubbles up and I have them have a two hour journey from when they get up in the morning to when they get to school and ask them, do you know um, which country your sheets were made in? Of course, nobody does. Um, so we do come up with answers. So um, one person will say um, Egypt, that they have very, very fine linen and cotton. And uh, then they say, oh, when somebody says China, they all say yes. Mm -hmm. I said, do you know the um, human rights abuses of um, the sweatshops in China? And, and I steadily go through, you know, do any of you use um, hair dryers or, or, or hair straighteners? I don't need to, um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, and so we go, and what did you have for breakfast? I had orange juice and cornflakes. Okay, let's look at that. Let's, we, we need to interrogate sources. 
you know, a plastic piece of meat in the supermarket does not tell you about sauce. It tells you about food that you're going to eat. So, you, you know, we say, I say to them, well, if you had orange juice, it needed um, trees to be planted. It needed the farmer to harvest, possibly human labor to, uh, to harvest or machines. It needed to go to a cannery to be um, put into um, cans or cartons, then needed to go to a distribution center, then to a supermarket, and your parents or yourself had to go down and get this from the shop. So interrogating sources, and, and they would go in, you know, mechanical, raw, natural, and they'd have this mind map. And I said, hundreds of people, hundreds of people have helped your quality of life this morning in these first two hours. And it's true, we need to reflect on the quality of life that we have and all those who have given us that quality of life by their labor. And Alice Walker, one of your great um, literary artists, she said, I shudder to think that the clothes I wear, somebody might have died because of the sweatshops. Well, she, she heard, uh, heard about it and then that was her, her response, I shudder to think that someone has died for me to wear this, these clothes. So that's part of the confrontation and responsibility that we have. Um, so poetry is another confronting creative tool. Are there poets among us here? There are, I know there are. Yeah. Good, good. And so you'll understand, well, we'll all understand because we're creative people. Um, po poems are often written and help us um, come up short and be challenged. Um, artists, wordsmiths, they challenge us to live in the light, in integrity and truth. I'll, I'll speak two poems. One is that beautiful poem by Catherine Jean Cowan. I don't know what congregation she belongs Catherine, to. Uh, Cowan, yeah. Catherine Jean MSJ. Oh, she's an OP. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this, this is her poem, The Gift of Hunger. And the other one, which is far more confrontational, um, is by Elmer Mitchell in Poems Dark and Dangerous. But this is one that taps into our hunger as Dominicans. Unsearched for quiet nurtures well the gift of hunger born, while bearing deep within that word, that single word whose truth will sift all truths until its silence sounds above the din. Too soon we speak our selfish word, too slow we hear the one unspoken word that cries within. We howl against its wind to show our truth and find so late we've fostered lies. And yet, and yet how graced we are. Our self-filled word creates a void that cannot satisfy. Our hearts will ever hope until they've heard that word in which all human words can die. O word, we yield before your truth. We hear your cry. Our hunger knows that you are near. And the poem of protest. This poem is dangerous. It should not be left within the reach of children or even of adults who might swallow it whole with possibly undesirable side effects. If you come across an unattended, unidentified poem in a public place, do not attempt to tackle it, to tackle it yourself. Send it, preferably in a sealed container, to the nearest center of learning, where it will be rendered harmless by experts. <laughs> <laughs> Even the simplest poem may destroy your immunity to human emotions. All poems must carry a government warning. <laughs> Words can seriously affect your heart. The one word Christ brought has affected ours. So trauma and adequacy and protest often lie at the root of much creative life. Many artists, as we know, died in poverty, struggling to pass on what they deeply intuited and felt compelled to share in visual form. Van Gogh is a clear example. His letters to his brother Theo are one of the most moving testaments to the human spirit, trying to make sense of his life, 
his multiple failures in inverted commas and the world around him through the tangible means of his art. What does he say? He says, I have a terrible need. This is writing to Theo. I have a terrible need. Shall I say the word? Then I go out at night and paint the stars. Mm -hmm. Art can be subversive, and it deals with the undercurrents like that poem um, from Dark and Dangerous. Artists give voice to the reality, whether it's accepted or not. And I think that example of Vincent, um, it, it shows the fact that he had to keep doing this. This inside him had to, you know, as I spoke earlier about the um, ungendered midwives, he had to give birth to this through his creative output. Um, Catherine, what would Catherine say? We would have to speak out, um, you know, whether there's a government warning or not. No more silence, she would say. Oh, sorry, I forgot to show you the, there we are. <laughs> I forget to look at this, this thing here. <laughs> um, so Catherine would say, no more silence, shout out with a hundred thousand tongues. I'm seeing the world go to ruin because people are not speaking out. It is our duty at times to speak out. Truth seeking and truth bearing can reveal the dichotomies, the incompleteness, and the wounds of our times, both ours and others. We ignore them at our peril. The artist is always searching for the divine, searching for what can take us forward and give us meaning. The creative journey is often the result of unconscious, unsought for epiphanies. As artists, we wait on such epiphanies. You know, if we're a writer, we sometimes get writer's block and we wait and we wait and sometimes we wait a bit longer. Mm -hmm. Life is not conditional. It's in flux and it's unfolding and we have to have patient, patience with that, that becoming. It's autocatalytic. Bring them on, the creative risk takers. Lead us to more life. That's you, that's me. The creative energy is the best hope we have for a better world. I have a couple of videos. Um, I'm just going to come to a bit of a conclusion here. None of us can control the creating forces that bring the stars to form and the God that continually abides, loving us and calling us deeper. But we are that stardust. The strong and resilient systems in nature, the web of connection that with all that pulses in life, we are part of that. And it's the stuff of those who embrace the creative impulse that help to give it form, the power of the spirit at work with us. This is potency and this is vision. This is God shaping in us that creative, ever transforming, ever converting call to wholeness and mission through the prism of art and life itself. We are invited to deepen the mystery, to connect with the extravagant divine outpouring at the dawn of creation with all the visual contemplative gaze that, that renders our world sacramental, as everyone said. We are all God has. We are stardust and sacramental, but the gift is not ours. It is given and given for sharing. That's why we bring it form. It doesn't just stay in our minds. I know we will continue to use it. So I'd like to um, finish with two videos. And um, one is called the Heart Matter video. Um, and the second one, I don't need to give you any, any um, it, it'll be stuff evident. So we're going to see if we can get, if our wonderful guru here to my right um, will. <laughs> May we acknowledge that each person has something beautiful to offer. May we not... Yeah. 
profoundly interconnected with the Earth's magnetic field. It affects us in more ways than we could ever have imagined before. frequency of the Earth's magnetic field, these field line resonances, is exactly the same as the human heart rhythm when we're in a coherent state.